appreciate it. It's all right. Now this is donated to Head for Base. Okay. Uh, it's a really good jacket. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that the young person didn't like it. Their grandma bought it for them and they didn't like it. So it's donated here. So we, I thought you'd know that I'm a bit more you know, suitable. Well, good morning, church, and welcome along to our service this morning. Trust you've all had a wonderful week, and um, we're looking forward to having our service this morning. Just wanted to um, open in a word of prayer. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come into your house, that we can come and worship your name. But most of all, Father, we thank you that you've done everything that you've done for us and that we can turn to you no matter what we're going through. So this morning, Lord, we just want to give you glory, honour and praise as we worship you. Amen. Would you stand this morning? We're going to sing the great old hymn, How Great Thou Art. This is a special hymn to me. My late husband loved this song and it was his favourite song and I found it was a couple of years before I could actually sing it because it just brought tears to my eyes every time. But I read the words of it and I hear the words of it and they're so deep in my life and so meaningful. So let's stand this morning as we sing, How Great Is Our God. wonder 
Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God. To thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. That God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on a cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. What a beautiful song, hey? And if we can sing How Great Thou Art, we can certainly thank the Lord for all the blessings that he has placed in our life. So let's count our blessings and sing that wonderful hymn too. the grove we're having a wonderful time with the children on fridays and we're starting to meet more and more parents every week and even this week as we did a funeral we met families that um are going to bring their grandchildren along to our play group on a friday morning but you know he's a good good father 
He's blessing us and he's always there for us. He hears our prayers. So let us sing. take your seats this morning. We're truly loved by him, aren't we? Um, Our announcements this morning. I want to share just a little bit about what happened last night. We had our games night for our our ladies and gentlemen. Anyone was welcome and we had a great time at Penny's place. It all involved games involving food and perhaps a little bit of um, fun ten pin bowling with a kid's set and that was quite amusing actually even though we were playing with a kiddie set of 10-pin bowls. So (laughs) lots of laughter, lots of fun and lots of lovely food and you'll get the opportunity to taste some of that food this morning because we have it for morning tea. So please stay for that afterwards and the next announcements. Oh, there's a conference. uh, A gentleman's coming to speak here. He's from the Science Creation and he will be talking about Noah's Ark and the deluge of evidence for that. And so I think that would be a great service to be able to attend. And I'm certainly sure we're going to be hearing a lot more about Noah's Ark in the future too. Little Footprints, as I mentioned earlier today, going really well. We've got a great group of ladies and we're starting to see the growth there that's on the Friday morning. Uh, Men's Breakfast held here on the 25th of June. Please come along. Pastor Cameron's going to cook for you. Bacon and eggs and um, lots of those. No? What are we having this time? Pancakes. I can't hear what he said. Surprise. Surprise. Oh, well, there you go. I'm not even allowed to know. (laughs) 
And so um, generally a good feast, so come along, that'll be great if you're a male. Uh, we're meeting at Jenny's home in Sortel for Monday night's Bible studies and Malali is taking those along with Pam and Jenny as well. Okay, members meeting on the 26th of June. That is for our, the recall of pastors. So Cameron and I will be up for re-election for that and um, look forward to the future that God's got in store for us here at Coffs. Craft group, also on Tuesday mornings from 9.30. We're learning macrame at the moment. So Pam is um, teaching us very patiently how to tie those knots. Some of us aren't so good at that. That would be me. Happy feet, let's not forget. Come and join us at the jetty. It's been a bit chilly, the last one. And we've been fortunate that it rained a few too so that we couldn't make it. <laughs> but, but no, it's great. It is a joy to go out. I don't enjoy walking that much, but... I make myself go and, you know, the fellowship is lovely. It's nice to be able to catch up with the ladies and chat and just see our harbour, the beauty of God's creation there. Morning tea straight after the service with yummy cake from Pam. Awesome. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings this morning and as we do that, we're going to... Actually, we're going to watch a video first. The video next. Just put the next slide up so I'll know what's going on. Uh, we're going to sing. Yep. In Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest traps and storms. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seeks, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on
Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, for all that you've provided for us and for the financial situation that you've placed us in, Lord. We thank you for the way that you've given us work, that you've given us income so that we can certainly give back to you too some of what you've provided for us. Father, we pray that this offering will be used to build your kingdom here at Cox and just ask your blessing upon the people that have given this morning in your name. Amen. The reading comes from John chapter 6, verses 22 to 34. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realised that Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had left the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum, to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did, and now he offers you true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it. into another vessel, as seemed good to him. At first thought, the message is that God is the potter, we are the clay, and when our lives come apart, God will work with us to make us something beautiful. There's always another chance, a new beginning. We see the potter taking a ruined pot from the wheel and working with it, reforming the clay and creating a beautiful form. We too, are remade as we allow God to shape us. Did you know that there are many kinds of clay? All are basically mud dug from the earth, but you can combine different clays to make pottery that is white, hard porcelain, or coarse red earthenware, and many types in between. 
And what the clay has been through changes how one works with it. If clay is harder because it has dried out a bit, the potter has to adjust how it's worked. If clay has frozen and thawed, it needs more care in mixing together the wetter and the drier parts, but actually makes a more pliable clay than when it was fresh. Each of us is a unique lump of clay. God knows us and works with us according to our personality, our life experiences, and our possibilities. I think of my mother. My mother knew each of her children well and spoke with us as the unique individuals that we were. With one child, she would make rules and set clear boundaries and expectations, spelling them out so there'd be no misunderstandings. With another child, she'd be more subtle as she helped that child to form their own reasonable boundaries. With my brother, she might have said, no more jumping off the garage roof. But with my sister, she might need to be encouraging to her to take more chances, to step out and explore. She knew us, and she treated us as one of a kind. God does the same. Some of us have had difficult lives and maybe a little harder, needing some softening and tender loving care. Some of us have been easily molded into beautiful vessels, but have difficulty understanding those who have had a more challenging life than we've had. We may be broken vessels that have been pieced back together, but mosaics can be lovely. How difficult it can be to allow each other to be ourselves when we don't look or act like one another. During these days and weeks of social changes, fear of a virus every day upside down, it is tempting to judge how others are handling their new situations, which change daily or minute by minute. How human it is to judge. How like God it is to accept one another and love the uniqueness of each person. It is said that one can tell the character of a person by how they handle crisis. Let us hope that our response speaks of respect, kindness, and empathy. Thanks be to God. Let's stand as we sing some songs leading into pastoral prayer, but we're going to sing Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. Please stand.
fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My world lifts Sin runs deep, your grace is more, grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holy there is Christ in me. Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh God, how I need Please be seated. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you that you 
are so much a part of our lives that through you that we can live a, <coughs> a life that we know is worthy. That, Lord, as we listen to you, as we read your word, as the Holy Spirit touches our heart, and I am ever so grateful that you changed my life all those 30-odd years ago, Lord, where I discovered who you were and became a part of your family. And, Lord, as we continue to look to our community, to see where we need to be able to touch people's lives or meet an area of need, I pray that our eyes are truly open to your leading that we see with kingdom eyes, that we see with eyes of love. <clears throat> and so, Lord, we just thank you for those opportunities you have sent our way, new families that we meet um, through different things that we do, through shopping, through conducting funeral services, all those things. But, Lord, we are ever so grateful that you are going before us and opening these hearts of these people so that, they will come. And just thank you for these new families that are going to be coming to uh, Little Footprints, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as they come, they will feel this as a safe place, a place that they can reach out and, and share with us what is happening in their lives, giving us opportunities to touch their lives, to minister to them, but also to able to show them how to be a part of your family. Lord, we just want to thank you for the Northside Bakery and for Fresco, Lord, because the managers there and the owners there have such gracious hearts that they willingly donate their goods to us to help feed the kids at Tyala School. And so, Lord, we just ask that you bless them and encourage them and uplift them. And, Lord, also that you allow opportunities for us to talk to them about why we are doing this and who is behind all this, and that is you, Lord. Lord, we just think of Anne and Charlotte as they head to Sydney and as Charlotte is uh, a toddler, Lord, who's heading in for more health tests to uh, work out what needs to be done next um, to discover um, some reasons why she is like um, she is with her health as well, Lord. And so we ask that your hand be upon them. Keep them safe in their travels keep them safe in Sydney, and as Charlotte goes in to have these tests, that, Lord, you'll be able to give us this child this peace and calmness so that she can do these tests without having them to be repeated because she's anxious and struggling and, and wanting to move. And so, Lord, we just ask that you will just guide the doctors as they read those results, give them insight and wisdom, allow their skills and knowledge to come to the fore so that they can help Charlotte in the life that she is leading. And Lord, through all this, may your Holy Spirit be felt by her mum. And Lord, may we have the opportunities to this week to text and talk with her to see how things are going and so we can encourage her uh, uh, through this time. Lord, we just ask you to be with Megan and her partner as, through her pregnancy as they continue to uh, look forward to this child. And Lord, as she goes through the pregnancy, may your hand be upon her and the child and just knit that baby in such a way that she'll come out and will be such a special child, Lord, that her mum and uh, her dad can not but just go, this child is so wonderful. So what if we made that this baby will just point them to the things of the Heavenly Father? Lord, we also think of uh, Debbie and Peter and we ask that you continue to be with them as they struggle with their health, as they seek medical advice and have surgery and and do all the specialists that they need to go to. And I pray that you will just give them a sense of your presence as they go into the doctors and the specialists and into the surgery and the test, Lord, that you, that they will just know that you are there with them through this time. I pray for the opportunities uh, for your love to be 
evident for them through their friends and family who know God and through staff who know you too, Lord. Just give the specialists and the doctors and the surgeons all the wisdom and knowledge they need to do what needs to be done to bring their health back to normal, Lord. We just think of the Northcott family as they continue to mourn the loss of Vida, Lord, and we pray for David and Kerry and John as they have lost their mum and, Lord, this is something that has taken a hold of their heart. Lord, I just pray, just come into their midst, wrap your arms around them, fill their hearts with your love and grace and mercy. May your presence be felt in such a way they cannot help but think of you. May the family members who know you, Lord, just come around them in prayer and uplift them and encourage this, this family as they mourn the loss of Vida. Lord, we just thank you that as a church family that we can come together and just praise and worship you. And Lord, as we go through our daily lives, may we not dismiss that nudge in our heart, that little voice in the back of our head that as we see people in need, as we see people in stress, that we just don't look at them and keep walking, but, Lord, that we immediately just bring them up in prayer to you and uplift them to you, but also, Lord, that we will be able to do something, whether it's just go and ask, are you okay? Do you need help? May we be led in our lives in such a way that we can minister with your love to our friends and our families, to people we pass on the street. Because, Lord, I really want us to share your love in such a way that, and have it in our lives in such a way that this cost community cannot help but just wonder why we are so loving and where that comes from which then gives us the opportunity to say it's from God. So this week, may there be opportunities for us to do that, Lord. May we be feel your prompt, your stirring in our heart, your voice in our head as we go through this community and help those who need help. Be with us now as we continue to praise and worship you as we hear your word. May we feel we refreshed and renewed from the songs that we sing. May there be something new in the way your word is brought today that will just be something we never thought of before, but also be something that we can use in our lives so we can grow stronger in our relationship with you and be able to st stand firm upon the rock of Christ in this world that does not think so. So, Lord, be with us now. Open our hearts and our minds to you in such a way. In your glorious name, amen. John 6.35 says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm going to look at the I am statements over the next couple of months <coughs> as we go through that and I I'm just going to go from the very first one and work my way through the very end one <coughs> and see where that brings us. <coughs> so when we look at this John chapter 6, it has this statement of I am the bread of life. So where do we begin? Well, let's go back in our Bible to the start and when God created Adam, he created him hungry. Adam came into existence with his stomach growling for food and his heart aching for God. So what does God do? Well, right after breathing life into Adam, he brings him into the Garden of Eden and shows him all the delicious food that is there to eat. Adam's first meal was the fruit God gave him in the garden. 
Not only was Adam created hungry, but we are also born with empty stomachs needing food. When babies are born, they, like Adam, are born hungry. Even when we look at death and resurrection patterns in life, we see that we are symbolically reborn each morning into a new day. And when we wake up, we wake up hungry. We wake up needing to eat. Some of us will be pretty cranky until we are filled up with food and our stomachs are satisfied. This need for food reminds us of the God that created us as dependent beings. To survive, we need something from outside of ourselves brought into ourselves to sustain us. We need the air to breathe. We need the water to drink. We need the food to eat. This need for food, our growling bellies, is a constant reminder of the dependence on and the need for our Heavenly Father. In the same way that we will perish without food, we will likewise perish without the grace of Jesus Christ. Whenever we feel the pains of hunger or hear our stomach saying, feed me, fill me, we should be reminded of our dependence upon God and the need for Jesus and what he has done. Jesus says in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Whoever believes in me will never... Oh, sorry, I got them around the wrong way. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus has given us himself as the bread of life. For Jesus himself is the food that we need so that we don't perish. It is Jesus that nourishes our hungry souls. Jesus is the bread that gives life to his people. And it is really amazing when we look at our physical hunger, how it echoes and reminds us of our spiritual hunger. So often we look to feed our souls with something other than Jesus. And in this world that we live, it's not hard to do that. We so often think that we can fill our hungry hearts with entertainment, success, physical health, friends, financial security, intimate, passionate relationships, and so on. However, these types of meals only result in a malnourished soul that will wilt and wither away. We must feed upon Christ to have life, for we are entirely dependent upon the bread of life to sustain us both now and into eternity. There are many spiritual diets out there, but it's only Christ. And it's only in him we will find that living food, the all-satisfying, all-nourishing, soul-feeding, resurrecting bread of life. Throughout the Bible, bread is a symbolic representation of God's life-sustaining provision. When Jesus told the hungry crowds that he was the bread of life, he was teaching his followers that He alone was their true source of spiritual life, both in this present world and in the everlasting world. This bread of life that Jesus represents never perishes, never spoils, never runs out. 
In John 6, Jesus feeds a large crowd, more than 5,000 people. And that's, in the Bible, it says 5,000 people, but that was just the men. So add their families to it, it could be well and truly over 10,000. And he did this with just five loaves of barley, bread and two fish. That's all he was given. This miracle astounded the people who declared Jesus was the great prophet, the one that they had been expecting. But when Jesus saw that the people wanted to force him to be their king, he quietly slipped away to be alone in the hills. Again, the next day the crowds went in search of him and not because they understood this miracle, but because he had filled their physical bellies. The people were caught up in the day-to-day treadmills of getting their needs met and providing food for their hungry bellies. But Jesus was concerned with saving their souls. And he told them, don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. John 6.27 Believing in Jesus as the source of our spiritual existence is how we gain eternal life. And when we put our faith in him, he gives us spiritual bread that will not spoil, an abundant life that will never end. Jesus wanted the people to comprehend who he was. In John 6.33, he goes, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, the crowd didn't understand, so they asked for a miraculous sign, like when Moses gave the people the manna to eat in the wilderness. The crowd still saw Jesus merely as someone who could meet their physical needs. So Jesus responded with this powerfully, powerful and profane truth. In 6.41, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Christ explained to him that anyone who came to him in saving faith would never be hungry or thirsty ever again. God would not reject them, for it is, was his will that all should have faith in him. The listeners knew that Jesus by claiming he came down from heaven, was declaring that he was God. He was the real bread of heaven, the ever-present daily manna, the life-giving, eternal source of provision for today, tomorrow and all eternity. The people wanted this bread. But when Jesus explained to them that he himself was the bread, they became more and more offended. Their offence turned to revulsion when Jesus explained that he came to them to give his flesh and blood, to sacrifice his life so that the world could have eternal life. He declared, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life with you, John 6, 53. He was teaching them. but they didn't understand. And it was so difficult for their mind to comprehend that the disciples started to fade away. Only those whose spiritual hearts had been opened could comprehend that to eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood meant to be grasped by faith the significance of Jesus' death on the cross. It is the death of Jesus that takes away the curse, which is sin, and rescue those who receive his forgiveness for spiritual death. Christ's sacrifice on the cross enables us to receive eternal life. To all who believe in him, 
except Jesus. He is the bread of life. It'll never perish, never spoil, never run out. It is life-sustaining to be received by us day by day. In the New Testament, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We need to come back to Jesus every day. We can trust God to meet our needs as we live in this world. Jesus said, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than that they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothings, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you, Matthew 6, 26 to 30. Part of feeding on our daily bread means spreading, spending time each day in the word of God and allowing it to come into our hearts, into our lives. According to scripture, the word of the Lord is more important than food to sustain our daily existence. Yes, he was God, but he humbled himself. And he wants you to be humble. He wants you to understand that this food, this manna from heaven, is him. He did it to teach you that the people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus shows us the importance of depending upon God's word, especially when Satan is tempting us, when we feel all alone, when the things of the world pressure us, when Satan crowds our life and wants to crowd out God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We need to depend upon God's word. For the Lord fasted for 40 days and nights and the devil came to him in that wilderness and enticed him to rely on the resources that we hear, the resources that Satan could supply him. And Satan said, I'll turn those stones into loaves so that you could have bread to eat. But Jesus resisted all the devil's seduction, all the things he was telling him with a powerful declaration of God's truth. In Matthew 4, 4, it tells us exactly. No, the scripture say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus could not and would not be tempted to rely upon his own power. He lived to do the will of his father. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me from finishing his work. Christ is our example. If we trust God to provide daily needs, so ought we. When we obey God's word, live by his word, we feed on the bread of life given by our heavenly father. The Bible promises us that God is faithful to sustain us who are devoted to him. Once I was young and now I am old, yet I will never, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread, Psalm 37, 25. Jesus identified himself again as the bread of life, the living water, the way he did not present himself as a source of salvation, as the only way he did not present himself a source of salvation, but he presented himself as the only way 
to salvation. There is no other way. Without him, without the bread of life, there is no hope. There is no spiritual hunger satisfied. He is the source of forgiveness. Jesus makes the path to repentance and a relationship with God plain, simple and available for everyone. There are no additional sacrifices of works. Romans 10.9 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The bread of life sustains the believer. So as you wake up tomorrow, as you go through today, as your physical stomach growls or carries on because it's hungry, let it be a reminder that you also need to feed spiritually upon the bread of life, upon God's word. And allow it to fill your heart to embolden your soul to just give you the power that you need to live this life for him. Are you feeding on the bread of life? Are you allowing it to sustain you every day? Lord, we just thank you and praise you that you are a part of our life that Jesus is the bread of life. He's that heavenly manna that we can come upon and just take into ourselves and just fill us up to our soul just overflows. As we read your word, as we talk with you, may your love just fill us over. May we never feel that spiritual hunger in such a way that we feel like we never are full. But Lord, may that spiritual hunger just keep enough there so that we keep reading your word. We're still full, but not quite. So that we read your word and talk with you and fellowship with people and, and meet people in the community and share your love and share about the bread of life that lasts for all eternity, that never perishes, never runs out, that sustains us all the time. So as we go this week, may we truly feed upon your word. Allow it to fill our hearts, our souls, our mind. <coughs> and in doing that, may we be able to help other people learn how to satisfy their hunger by coming to know who Jesus Christ is. We praise you and we worship you and we are thankful for the sustenance that you provide us every day. In your glorious and wonderful name, amen. Please stand with me as we sing in closing, Christ is enough. Now, we haven't sung this song for a long time, but it is such a great song because Christ is enough. Please stand. There's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will see no turning back. I've been set free. Christ is Joy of my salvation.
have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. In Christ. That is so true as we accept Christ and start heading towards the cross and our relationship with him and as it grows and deepens the world is behind us and that's where we need to keep it in Christ is enough so as you go this week may your love and compassion continue to grow a love that is full of knowledge and wise insight so that you will be able to recognise what really matters and live a pure and blameless life because you are sustained by the bread of life, Jesus Christ. See you at morning tea downstairs. Enjoy a cuppa and a chat and we'll catch up with you then. Make his face shine upon